It's the ice that brings Persephone from her quilted palace to the white sidewalks of Congress Street. Barricaded by snowbanks and Atlantic wind, she pulls her dark wool coat close and strolls ahead to pass underneath the dotted path of electric street lamps. Every 12 steps, she flickers in the sophistication of unkempt film cells. Persephone wears a pair of reading glasses she had found in a field behind her high school gymnasium in Sunny Gap, Arkansas. The teen mascot was a razorback, more or less a filthy pig, outvoting the armadillo two to one in public election back in 1982. She never leaves her window without those glasses for the same reason she prefers to walk through the falling snow. It isn't that Persephone romanticizes over death, at least not in the sort that could be tattooed on her neck. But she does have a fascination for glass caskets. She also happens to believe a hearse is a pretty fine ride. The young lady of indifferent beauty steps up to a mailbox. She removes an envelope from her inside jacket pocket. The envelope is addressed to her sister Annabelle in Bridget, West Virginia. Inside the envelope is a watercolor of Jesus Christ walking upside down underneath the frozen surface of Lake Michigan. She had painted the scenery from a Michelob ad. Folded with the picture is her will with a set of conditions the first of which reads, Condition number one, I shall be buried in my glasses, as they will also be present for the open casket service. Condition number two, absolutely no flowers whatsoever. Condition number three, Mother shall keep my room exactly the same. Tell her to leave my dolls alone. I don't want her to put them back together. The rest of the conditions follow in a similar manner. As Persephone delivers the letter through the steel trap, the mailbox howls like a tired split across her scarf-loosed neck. 
She has a last look around at her melancholy, a sigh for the ivory strangled fire escapes, a grin for the Atlantic wasps, and a cigarette for Longfellow's statue. The two lock eyes fixed, she decides to join him. She drops her cigarette and it disappears in the snow beside her black boot. And then, with the same way of comfort from home, she makes a bed in the snow and falls fast asleep. The night wears on to early morning and most of the city rises before the sun. A number of people on way to work form a crowd around the indifferent beauty still framed in the snow before them. She looks quite lovely there. The crowd perpetuates until one by one the people make their own nests in the snow one by one, they shut glassy eyes tight. One by one, the city falls back asleep. Days turn to weeks, and weeks to silent slumbering months, until one early morning in March, with the mask of spring in the air, Persephone opens her eyes. The once pristine snowbanks have been replaced by sandbag piles of human bodies. A dozen small dogs decompose around a telephone pole nearby, tied in a circle like a broken carousel. She cannot help but feel mistaken in her course of actions. She unbuttons her coat, unfurls her scarf, and steps over to a public telephone. She managed to scrounge up the change from here and there to call long distance to Bridget, West Virginia. Annabelle? Anne? She whispers because her mouth is dry. Hello? Who am I speaking with? This is your sister. I need to tell you something. I'm sorry I ever took them. I want to give you your glasses back. Annabelle needs a moment to recollect. It has been eight years since she had seen those glasses. Mom and I were under the impression that you were dead. Persephone takes a gander at the overwhelming carnage sprawled all around her, then notices the mailman rotting over a park bench. No, I am doing fine, but I do miss the snow. In Bridget, West Virginia, Annabelle smiles. Mother and I agree. Winter is such a lovely 